Hi, and welcome back to Channel 11. Today is uh, March 2nd, and I've got a special guest today, Chris Flanagan. He is a fixed income and securitized product strategist at Bank of America Securities. And he's got a great take on the economy, interest rates, housing, and uh, some of those securitized product markets out there. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time, and we're really interested in, in hearing about uh, your thoughts on the markets right now. Great. Well, thanks, Ken. Um, and I'm fresh back from the Las Vegas Securitized Products Conference, so have some interesting perspective. Very fresh from uh, from that experience over the last few days. Um, you know, the title here. We're just going to go through <clears throat> the B of A view on the economy and and rates. That's kind of from my colleagues in economics and interest rate strategy. <clears throat> and then I'll share my thoughts of what that means for housing and more broadly securitized products. So, you know, the little subtitle here down in yellow on the slide, and it gives a little perspective for how I'm framing the presentation. Um, we're a little bit beyond three months now from when we put out <clears throat> our year ahead outlook. That was sort of late no November, right around uh, Thanksgiving. Um, so we have a, we had a perspective for uh, 2023. And that's pretty much the title. The first bullet there, soft landing, was more likely in our view at that point. And we thought that that would end up with uh, resulting in tighter spreads by year end 2023. Um, the good news, well, the story about that right now is that uh, all the good news that we had anticipated and spread tightening, a lot of it is already priced in. And we'll go through you know, some of our targets uh, for different sectors, take a look at, at what's happened. But um, I think basically, uh, if I had to summarize it, things have gotten, you know, markets sort of gotten ahead of itself a little bit uh, on the rally that we've started out the year on. Um, and I think we probably have to uh, give back a little bit of that spread tightening. Um, a lot, as always, depends on, you know, the Fed outlook. Um, we'll share our views on that. But Beyond our, you know, kind of baseline view that I'll present, I'll sort of get into what I call the risk scenario, um, and it, you know, clearly is related to inflation. And you know, I think more broadly, we're sort of casting that inflation story in the context of um, the uh, deglobalization, if you will, that broad term. And I'll go through some of that, what that might mean. But you know, I kind of summarize that overall view of the world through two-year inflation break-evens. And I think it tells us some very interesting things about you know, where the Fed is, what it's doing with policy, and what it may need to do right now. We have a lot of numbers here. Um, it's, as I said, sort of the B of A econ rates forecasts. And then we take those and put, plug them into uh, the various sectors in securitized products and, you know, sort of came up with some projections of how things would play out quarter by quarter uh, in 2023. So, you know, the four columns on the left are the historical data, the sort of mustard colored uh, column in the center is where we were as of uh, yesterday, um, the latest data readings that we have across all these different uh, lines. And then uh, the next four or five columns are our forecast for, you know, 2023 and then out as far as 2024. So, um, you know, the way I just go through some of the talking points up top. So I think the way I would characterize the B of A econ team, they've been pretty much on the hawkish side of the market, thinking the Fed needed to do more. You know, that was pretty much the case through all of last year. Um, they were that way up until, let's say, a few weeks ago. And I think more recently, the market has kind of caught up and is pretty much right on top of where uh, our guys are in terms of um, the economic outlook and perhaps more importantly, the Fed outlook. So, you know, a couple of the highlights here, um, you know, they do think that unemployment is headed higher. Uh, they think it'll reach, let's say, 4.1 uh, percent 
um, by Q4 of 2023. So it's only modestly higher. Um, and then it gets into 4.6% uh, Q1 of 2024. Uh, GDP, you see here that they have uh, negative GDP starting around Q3. So they have a mild three quarter recession priced in here or penciled in. Um, but you know, overall, pretty slow growth for 2023, 1% GDP growth for this year. Um, I think the inflation numbers, they do show, let's say, CPI, quarterly uh, CPI hitting, getting down at 2.3% by uh, year end 2023. So, you know, kind of getting to where the Fed would like it. Um, but, you know, I think what we're seeing more recently perhaps suggests maybe there's a little upside risk around that. So the way we thought about 2023 is that we thought that there would be one more hawkish episode, you know, perhaps not as dramatic as what we had uh, last year, but that you know, the Fed would have to sort of tighten the screws once again. Uh, and I think the way things are shaping up right now, it feels like that was the right call. Um, and we thought that that would lead to you know, one more risk off episode. Um, as I said, you know, at the outset, um, we've seen some pretty significant spread tightening to start this year. So ABS and CLOs are you know, uh, uh, sort of leading the way kind of near the year end targets. Um, but, you know, it's sort of re reflecting some very strong technicals um, in the market. And I would argue um, perhaps some loosening of financial conditions that the Fed needs to respond to. I do want to highlight, you know, sort of the benchmark call for us is that uh, we end up this year at 325 on the 10 year. Um, our rates guys did sort of revise their rate outlook recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, and what they did is sort of push up the front end. So they now have the two year uh, hitting 485 uh, or ending Q1 23 at 485, obviously very close to where we are right now. And the same thing for the 10 year where um, they have us hitting 4% at Q1 23 and we're over that as of today. So um, a little bit overshoot. And I think, you know, we're starting to see, let's say, a little bit more of the risk scenario for the grid of uh, spread forecasts. So that's the rate environment. Um, next up, we'll talk about, let's say, the mortgage market and housing. Um, you know, I've had a ton of calls over the last six to 12 months with a lot of our equity clients, uh, people in the home builder space. A um, lot of questions around why mortgage mortgage rates are so high relative to treasuries. Um, yep. you know, I've had explained optionality, the role of interest rate volatility, how that in elevated interest rate <clears throat> volatility was driving you know, the mortgage rate treasury basis so high. Um, our view was that as we kind of finally reach terminal rates for the Fed, you would start to see uh, interest rate volatility come down. So we show the move index kind of got down pretty low over the last month or so. It's kind of back up at that 125 area right now. Um, we do think that, you know, it has potential to, to move lower again, as the Fed's path becomes a little bit more certain. And sure. you know, that, that would set up a possibility for that mortgage rate, treasury rate basis to, to tighten. So, you know, we had the view that we would end up this year um, 325, as I said, on the 10 year, roughly a 200 basis point spread. It's been north of 250 to close around 275 for some time now. So some compression of that spread, and that would get us down to a five and a quarter 30 year mortgage rate using the Freddie Mac survey rate. Um, that was part of why when we think about, uh, home price appreciation, I would characterize our view as a little bit more constructive and positive than you know some of the forecasts that are out there. So um, we had the view that we would end up 2022 at 5%. We ended up at 5.8%. So you know we feel pretty good about that view. And then you know thinking about things from a year-over-year -year basis, obviously the peak in home prices occurred in Q2 of 22. So we think that, you know, sort of the biggest decline year over year decline will occur in Q2 of 23. And we have it, you know, basically 
a peak to trough view of uh, down 5%. So again, I think that would put me a little bit more constructive and positive uh, on you know the, the housing story and particularly the home price story. I'd say the key reason you know, for that relatively constructive view is the whole supply story, the inventory levels that are so low. Um, and I think, you know, that remains a, an extraordinarily, you know, supportive factor for the housing market. One of the stats I like to look at, you know, very simple to think about this one. We have, you know, basically 870,000 homes, single family homes on the market right now for a country of 330 million. So it's just kind of the staggering sort of multiple there of uh, yeah. ability to move. I think a lot of it is being driven by, you know, the years of underbuilding that we've had in the housing market. And now, you know, more recently, the enormous backup in rates has impacted, you know, the willingness of a lot of uh, homeowners to sell and give up, you know, the incredibly attractive mortgage rates that they got during the pandemic and the subsequent period of, of QE. So, you know, I think that remains a powerful force constraining supply coming coming into the market. And, you know, if we're right that the Fed reaches sort of its terminal rate, rate vol comes down, mortgage rates compress, we do see some interest rate support for the housing market, you know, kind of in the back half of the year. Um, so we end up with a view that this year, we're going to see home prices basically flat um, and then next year as well. So we, we acknowledge, you know, with that view that home uh, prices uh, are high rates and affordability rates are high affordability is kind of low. So it's, we're not saying back to the races in terms of HPA, but it's just more sort of bouncing around the unchanged level, you know, for an extended period of time, depending, you know, in a sense on how, how the rate story plays out. And that's that's na that's your nationwide assumption. Obviously, some pockets um, we could see some yeah. price declines, places that went up too much, or there's a lot of building like in the Southwest, right? Right. So you know, I think it has been interesting to see to watch the the regional differences. So you know, the West Coast really was the first mover in terms of uh, prices rolling over, particularly you know the tech heavy cities like San Francisco, San Jose. Um, yeah. Seattle, all of those are kind of led the way lower. I think those, you know, those markets in a sense, a lot of uh, uh, those, those workers, you know, sort of the theory in a sense is that those guys, you know, kind of hit the bid right off the bat. They, you know, kind of smelled the trouble in the tech sector, thought it was a good time to, you know, cash in their chips on an incredible run up on, on home prices. So you did get, I think, a first leg lower. Uh, on that. And, you know, over the last three months, when we look at, let's say, like the uh, the core logic numbers that come out, we've seen pretty much three months in a row of almost 0% HPA, maybe down, you know, on a monthly basis, a little bit more than that. But basically, we've already entered, you know, the flat zone and on, on in terms of home prices. So um, I think, yeah, like, we'll probably have a little bit less dispersion going forward in terms of, you know, those markets, like, like I said, that I alluded to already being, you know, leading the way lower. I think we're starting to see some of those markets, you know, maybe slow down in terms of the price declines. And then the other phenomenon that's out there is, let's say, related to the internal migration within the U.S. So obviously sort of the peak of the housing market, you have a lot of stories about tech workers moving from San Francisco down to Austin, Texas, as a one example. But I think that broader theme remains intact in a powerful way that there are still a lot of people with intrinsic you know, desires to perhaps move from expensive northern markets down to the Sun Belt, you know, retirees perhaps, or even other workers, tech workers still looking for you know, cheaper housing, cheaper, uh, better tax environment. So some of that stuff, I think, still creates some activity in the housing market. And, you know, you'll see the demand in some of those Southern uh, Sunbelt markets probably remain a little bit, you know, strong and perhaps stronger than people might have thought. And um, the other factor, I, you know, I mentioned supply is a key factor, but the other one really um, is the wealth effect. Um, you know, we had a, we've had a ton of wealth generated in the U.S. Um, over the last few years with the stimulus that we got. Obviously, mm -hmm. some of it given back last year, but still, you know, on net, 
pretty significant gains uh, in wealth. And I think that that can be a significant contributor to, you know, some of this internal mobility in the in the U.S. So, you know, somebody may be a little disappointed they missed the absolute peak down, in, uh, you know, last year. But, you know, they still had it in mind that they were moving down south, perhaps retiring. You know, they'll do what they have to on a price concession on selling their home to execute the move that they, you know, probably wanted to do for lifestyle reasons or life purposes, a little bit more than just the economics. And, you know, with that wealth buildup, they can take a little bit of a hit on the sale and, you know, again, move to some of these Southern markets that are a little bit cheaper. Yeah, I think that's why you saw pending home sales finally tick up. It's buyers and sellers are coming to grips with, you know, the the sellers are realizing I got to, you know, hit the lower bid. The buyers are realizing prices aren't collapsing. You know, mortgage rates came down a little bit. And as you said, you know, if, if, you're, if your family needs to move, you got to move and you're going to end up transacting to get it done, right? Exactly. And, you know, the other thing uh, you mentioned, the rates coming down, that, that really had when we went from 7% on the Freddie Mac survey rate down to six, that really had an enormous impact in terms of shifting psychology in the market to a much more positive tone. And you know, some of the calls we do with our home builder analysts, uh, some of the outside people that we speak with, say the woman from Ali Wolf from Zonda, you know, they really sort of registered a very significant turn in psychology uh, around January as the new year started. A lot of you know, people out looking once again, even at that 6% level. And then the other thing, Ken, that, that we did recently, we, you know, we get the data from uh, the mortgage rate lock data from um, Black Knight. And what's very interesting on that is you see a pretty dramatic uh, dispersion of rates that are getting locked in. So, um, you know, let's say when the median rate was 6%, which is, you know, again, that, that Freddie Mac survey rate, we saw people locking in rates as low as four and a half percent, you know, some of that is through buy downs perhaps, or, you know, somewhat maybe bank preferred customers on hybrid arms, something like that. But there was roughly 20% of the borrowers um, at that 6% headline rate, 20% of the borrowers were getting mortgage rates five and a half percent or below, you know, and then the distribution moved up to the high end you know, where you saw stuff as high as 775. So perhaps some of the guys like in the non-QM space uh, yeah. get a little bit higher rate. And I think the other part of it and what that drop in rates did for psychology um, is that, you know, people, there's the purchase decision, you know, that people have in mind. They're going to worry about the financing. They're going to worry about the affordability. But I think in many instances, if people found the house that they wanted to buy, you know, they deal with the relatively high cost of the mortgage, but keep in mind that a refi option, of course, is available to them at some point down the road if, you know, rates do decline. And so I think people, you know, kind of got past the sticker shock that we might have had as the first as rates really spiked higher last year, kind of adjusted to the new rate environment and, you know, again, began to 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 transact. So I do think um <laughs> You know, pending home sales, that that indicator, you think it bottomed in November, um, December. Uh, existing home sales, you know, sort of a couple months later, we're probably right around the bottom in the last month or two. And that's been a big story, obviously, for MBS turnover speeds that, you know, we saw some incredibly low turnover speeds on, on deep discount mortgages. Um, I think we probably have seen the seasonally adjusted bottom. Um, and as I say this, I'm, I'm keeping in mind or uh, I'm aware of the caveat, you know, of the risk scenario that, that we'll get to next. But um, assuming, you know, this baseline view that's represented on this grid, um, in that case, yeah, I think we've seen, you know, the bottom in turnover speeds, the bottom in existing home sales. Perhaps then, unless any question, maybe I'll move over to the uh, you know, the different sure. securitized products spread sectors. So, you know, what we yeah. saw first up is agency, MBS, the current coupon spread, just highlighting that story. Um, you know, we got out pretty wide levels last year, 175, 180, sort of at that peak area um, in October timeframe. And, yeah. you know, we came, came back in and we sort of, again, the, the rate vol story began to play out very favorably. 
uh, for that for that spread, and we got down, you know, more recently to a tight somewhere around the 120 area, and then, you know, as some of this hot data started to come back into the market, um, we did see, you know, rates start to move higher, rate volatility move higher, and you know that current coupon spread move higher. So we put out a note, you know, in the last couple of weeks saying that we wanted it to be overweighting. Uh, the basis somewhere in the 145 to 160 basis point range. Our uh, target, you know, was that we would end up Q, Q1 at 160 basis point spread. We're currently, you know, 155. So similar to the rate, the 10 year call, we're right in the zone and, you know, feeling pretty good overall about, you know, the numbers we've, we've laid out here on the grid. Um, you know, so at these levels, you know, it's not to say we're not going to get some some overshoot here um, of these ranges and and targets for Q Q1 end, but you know, as long as you're comfortable sort of riding through that um, and positioning, you know, for the back end of the year, we do think there are good buying opportunities. You know, again, again, both in let's say rates and duration, uh, but also uh, the up in coupon. We'll say like current coupon mortgages. Um, Little bit different story. We we totally agree with you on that call. Um, uh, we're we're it's almost like uh, you're repeating what I was telling clients the last two weeks. So we do agree both both sectors buy zone for treasuries, buy zone for agency mortgages right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hope we're both right. <laughs> so um, you know, then moving on to some of the credit sectors, that's where I think it, it's been quite interesting and. Certainly a lot of the, the dialogue in, in Vegas was around some of these markets. So we had, you know, like basically these non-QM, uh, Jumbo, RMBS, we had some of these spread levels where we were fairly, uh, you know, significantly wider at, at last year um, and have come in, you know, a decent amount, we'll, we'll say. Uh, I think just simple assessment of agencies versus whether, you know, AAA jumbos or non-QM, I think that basis has gotten, you know, a little bit tight and a little bit more in, in favor of uh, agencies over um, the non-agency sector. Um, so I, I think like we're setting some spread widening targets, but the biggest th thing and sort of takeaway almost from Vegas around some of these stories is just the technicals that, you know, the big, the elephant in the room, of course, is the mortgage market. We were running at, you know, four to four and a half trillion of uh, gross production in the last couple of years. And now we're looking at one and a half to two trillion. So that's been, I would say, like a game changer, if you will, for overall securitized products, technicals, just a lot less, you know, new mortgage production getting done. And so I think that helps to explain some of what's gone on in these uh, private label markets. Um, when you go down a little bit further, let's say um, single family rental is another you know, popular sector. Uh, it's been interesting to watch how dramatic the tightening has been there. So, you know, we were it was very much in the crosshairs of spread widening uh, last year. It got out to, you know, we had it ending the year at 180 bips. Um, and then we're now somewhere in the low 100s on that spread for the AAA. And you know, I, it's not that we're highlighting any particular problem um, in terms of the fundamentals, but it, it's just a simple valuation story that it just feel like it's a little bit rich. You see, we have it um, uh, target at the end of Q1 at 195 basis points. So you know, pretty meaningful widening penciled in over the next three to four weeks. I think chances are pretty good that's not going to happen that you know that magnitude of widening is unlikely to play out but you know perhaps some modest uh widening and then perhaps some of the widening that we thought might occur in q1 gets pushed out to q2 i, I think when i get into the risk scenario um perhaps that'll be you know a little bit more clear um credit risk transfer that was let's say uh crt uh, B, B2s and double B CLOs when we came into this year, they were like our top total return pick in, in securitized products. We just, you know, very simply like the floating rate exposure into a Fed that was 
continuing to tighten in our view with risk of even more tightening at the Fed than the market had priced in. And then, you know, these staggeringly wide spreads. So, you know, you were talking 15% yields coming into the, to the year. And, um, you know, we were expecting total returns on the order of 15 to 20% uh, in both of those sectors. Um, so, you know, we've, we've come in, um, again, perhaps a little bit quicker than we might have expected. So, you know, we might have to give some, some back, all right, in the near term. But overall, you know, we always look at CRT as one of the better ways to, you know, sort of transact the view, the relatively positive view that we've had on, um, you know, the housing market and, and mortgage credit fundamentals in particular. I guess one of the things is that, you know, while spreads on securitized have come in, spread on corporates have come in even more. So, you know, the, as we look at, you know, today, they still look cheap relative to corporates. They may not look as cheap relative to agencies, given the, the, the recent kind of backup in agencies over the last two, three weeks. But, you know, corporates arguably have run, you know, even further than a lot of these markets, right? Both high yield and IG. Uh, you know, I, I think so. Certainly that's been a like consistent story for us in terms of how, why we, you know, started with our year ahead, making the case for the value. And, and that was a big part of it, the cheapness relative to corporates. Um, I think some of those, that cheapness has been uh, kind of taken out of the market more recently. You know, some of, some of the spread pickups are just, you know, back to very average normal levels right now. So I think, yes, but it's not as compelling in our opinion right now. Yeah, well, de clearly December was December was the best time to get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, somewhat compelling. Um, I think the, you know, the, the remaining two credit sectors there's ABS and, and CMBS. You know, CMBS is probably the one sector that, you know, when we looked ahead to the to the new year, we had reservations down in credit. You know, obviously the, the office exposure um, is one that's continuing to unfold. And I think even taking it away from, from Vegas, there was still, even though, even though CMBS gets its own conference in January, Crestley down in Miami, you still have a ton of people going to Vegas to talk about CMBS as well. And, um, you know, I think nobody really has a lot of conviction around the down and credit story. Certainly a lot of distressed money interested in opportunities, but I think for many people, it's just too early to say where they really want to commit very heavily down in credit. So, you know, we're not surprised to see relative underperformance of, you know, we, we use the, the ICE uh, triple B CMBS index uh, as an indicator. We're not surprised to see, you know, relatively small spread tightening for this year. And we did expect to see some credit curve steepening. So that's kind of played out along the lines of what we expected. Um, I think the ABS market, you know, what we have here indicated as, as the spread for um, the AAA index of 67 basis points. Uh, what really struck me about that one, uh, when we looked at, uh, as our for at our forecast going forward, that is actually not the end of 2023 target. That was the end of 2024 target that we had when, you know, the Fed was already had rolled over fully, was easing, and we were, you know, fully in recovery mode uh, from the expected recession. Um, it concerns me a little that we got there, not in, you know, two years, but, you know, in less than two months. So um, that said, I can report, you know, from the conference that, um a lot of people are very interested in, in ABS. They just like the front end exposure. They feel, you know, sort of up in quality in, in ABS. They do feel like, you know, the protections that the structures provide you are, are very robust. So, you know, the, there won't really be any pronounced credit problems at the top end of the capital structure. Um, some of the, you know, subordinate classes, mezzanine classes are perhaps in sectors like subprime auto, you know, that's one where you look at double B subprime auto versus triple B, the spread basis is, you know, historically wide right now. And so that would be, you know, perhaps a sector that within the broader ABS universe that I would put on a similar footing to, let's say office exposure and CMBS. It's just the stories unfolding. Some of the, the credit metrics around the subprime borrowers are, you know, not pretty at all. You know, we've had a, a decent amount of discussion internally 
uh, on that story and trying to understand what exactly is going on there. And, you know, I think our takeaway, the simplest takeaway perhaps is what, you know, the pandemic and then all the stimulus and forbearance measures did to, let's say, distort, um, you know, what a FICO score might mean. Uh, we think that's kind of at play that, you know, the borrowers that ended up getting access to credit down at the low end of the credit spectrum quite well, quite possibly, you know, maybe a lot weaker borrowers than, than their FICO score suggests. So I think caution around like double B subprime auto is warranted just as some caution around, let's say triple B, you know, CMBS is, is warranted. Um, at, at some point on the, on the short ABS stuff, I mean, if you get inside 50, it's like, why not just buy the treasury? Right. You're, you're still like, you're, you're not giving up much, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess, you, you know, you would know better than I, but if you're a securitized products investor, you know, you're not really paid to, to invest in treasury. <laughs> so, so, you know, take, take the 50 bips of extra spread up at, you know, pretty high yielding front end of the yield curve and you get that much more, you know, return. So I, I was, I just, all I'd say is I was, it was noteworthy to me that sentiment around short dated ABS uh, was quite positive at the, at the Las Vegas conference. I'll take, I'll take it to another extreme as I go visit where, with our investors. Uh, the same enthusiasm for the six month T-bill exists out there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I, I think that it's just simply an extension of that. Yeah. And, you know, there's comfort, there's confidence, you know, after last year, there's a lot less confidence to go into, you know, 10 year treasuries or 30 year treasuries uh, right now. But, you know, six month T bills or, you know, less than one year ABS, I think people feel pretty comfortable that that can be navigated, you know, pretty well. And especially given the yields that are available up at the front end. And then, you know, maybe, maybe just wrap up the spread views on on CLOs, um, you know, there, I, I think I would say the market has been perhaps a little surprised at how, how well the AAA part of the capital structure uh, has performed this year. So, you know, you have seen uh, money coming in, um, you know, we're still waiting for Japanese investors to come in, you know, more meaningfully into AAAs. They've been a little bit dormant in the last year or so. Feels like that, you know, once we get through Q1 and get into their new year and Q2, that they're, you know, going to be putting some money work to work in the AAA part of the, the CLO capital structure. So, you know, technicals are in that market, I think, look pretty good once you anchor, you know, the AAA part of the capital structure. Um, I think the question will be, and this is almost sort of leading into, you know, the risk scenarios is, um, around the fundamentals, around the leverage loan market, you know, a lot of discussion around um, the capacity um, to continue to service floating rate debt in the context of a Fed that, you know, has at least, say, three more rate hikes, if not more, and then, you know, keeping rates at an elevated level for an extended period of time that it, the view is that more and more of those issuers in the leverage loan market are going to struggle in terms of interest coverage. Um, and so, you know, you can see downgrades picking up, you know, you have the triple C buckets currently for the entire CLO market, it's somewhere around 6%. You know, you get over the seven and a half percent threshold, then you're starting to look at risk of, you know, breaching some OC cushions and, you know, turbling into the triple A. So that story is, is out there. Our view is we're gonna end up with uh, overall, roughly 10% uh, uh, seal, uh, triple C bucket by, by year end 23. So, you know, I do think there are some, some dynamics around that down at the, you know, the bottom of the capital structure where investors will really have to be, you know, pretty careful in terms of their, you know, manager and particular bond selection, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis that triple C exposure, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the OC cushions and how robust they are right now. You know, you've moved to, to the downside risk scenario. Again, you know, we the the baseline framework that I just presented in that grid basically had us like, let's say roughly modest spread widening um, uh, in the next month or so, uh, but still, 
with targets at year end that are, you know, for the most part, tighter than where we are right now. That's that's the baseline view. Here's the, the risk scenario, and it's one that you know I think is um, in one way or another on everybody's mind. Everybody has awareness of this to some degree. This idea of deglobalization, sort of an emerging new paradigm, um, where you know the four-year bond rally that we had ended, and now you know we're in a world where uh, disinflation is no longer the story, but inflation is the story. So. You know, I can hear what we have is my attempt to capture it in one number, um, the two year break even rate. And, you know, but basically, you know, the thesis here on this slide is both the combination of COVID and all the various responses that that came out of that, you know, fiscal, monetary, um, security, uh, supply chains, you know, all of those, those responses um, have really shifted us away from globalization and disinflation to, you know, a world of fragmentation and inflation. And then, you know, you take that environment and you layer on an additional, you know, geopolitical shock, such as the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And it just, you know, really exposes, we'll say, the fragility of the system in this new environment. And so, you know, we had a obviously a, a super spike in inflation expectation and expectations and inflation last year. And it's sort of forced the Fed um, to a new level of, um, let's say, hawkishness. Um, <laughs> but I think the way I'm thinking about this is that um, that that event of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, you go back to um, October of 2021. I don't think many people had that on their radar. Uh, as something to think about. But I think what you're supposed to think in today's world is that events like that, while, while still very difficult to predict, so for example, right now, I don't have anything in particular in mind that I would point to. You know, the China-Taiwan story is one that's out there um, that people think about as potentially a, a significant risk event. It seems the consensus is that nothing is hap likely happening anytime soon. So that's out there. But there are other things that I think that are part of this world that um, you could point to that perhaps, you know, could be somewhat of a trigger. So, you know, for example, like close to home in our world with the uh, student loan ABS sector, for example, um, a lot of focus on this debt forgiveness story. You know, if something like that seems like it's struggling to get past the Supreme Court as uh, the Biden administration initially envisioned it. But, you know, perhaps they have an alternative that they end up, you know, basically uh, forgiving decent amounts of debt that a lot of people may not be too happy about. And maybe, you know, one, it's, again, emblematic representative of the world we're in, but perhaps, you know, has some knock-on effects, unforeseen effects that people might not fully expect or anticipate right now. And again, you put this into a relatively fragile system, you know, the recipe is there for um, some adverse Im impact. So, you know, the w moving down to the bottom of the chart, and I'll just kind of wrap up my comments with this. Um, we look at the two year break even inflation rate, take a, a 10 year history. Um, the red line on the chart shows the average pre um, November 2020. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't go into looking at this with the idea that, you know, look, the world changed on November 2020. And, but when I looked at this chart, it was quite striking to me that, um, you know, literally the week of November, this is a weekly frequency chart, literally the week of November 6th or 8th, 2020, that was sort of this, the launching pad for, you know, a new way, new level of break even. So, you know, you see on the chart goes like right at that vertical line designates that November, 2020 date. It sort of goes from that pre um, uh, 1120 average of 1.3% two year break even rate. And it moves up to a new level. And, you know, the new average level is 2.9% since then. Um, and, you know, I think what was particularly interesting 
even as we've been talking about this call and, and from the initial day to where we are today, um, over the last month or so, we've seen that rate go from roughly 2% to 3.3%. So a fairly dramatic rise. And, um, you know, I think a couple of factors would uh, point to obviously some of the strong data that we had. We've had over the past month, I think the Fed, uh, you know, uh, Fed Chair Powell at the press conference, probably more dovish than, you know, he needed to be. Uh, back then, they probably should have done a 50 basis point rate hike at that meeting than 25. Um, and the market, you know, very quickly ran with it. What, you know, to me is really interesting and, and you know, I, I think kind of noteworthy is that level where we're at right now, 3.2%, 3.3%. That's pretty much exactly where we were in October, 2021. So, you know, a, a year after the election. Um, and again, you go back to that time frame. nobody had the Russia thing on their, uh, on their radar. Um, you know, people were thinking the Fed needed to start hiking. But what kind of blows me away is when you go back and you look at, well, how many Fed rate hikes did the market have priced in at that point, you know, by Feb 23? It had two rate hikes priced in. We we ended up with 18, and by 18, I mean 18, 25 basis point hikes. So, you know, four and a half percent. So, you know, I just sort of raised this as kind of a question, like, and, you know, our chief economist, Ethan Harris, put out a note today just talking about, you know, some of the error terms and forecast error that's out there, you know, for everybody that, you know, everybody is subject to it, market participants, the Fed, economists, um, that, you know, if in any way <laughs> there's a repeat of what happened from October 2021, where, you know, the market now has three more rate hikes priced in, but perhaps some event occurs to trigger, you know, some upward inflationary pres pressures, perhaps it's just more organic and internal that it, it gets generated. The this you know sort of surging inflation expectation and that feedback loop into actual in inflation numbers, you know I look at this and say, boy, this is an extraordinary you know moment we're in right now where it feels generally and again as I you know kind of described the Vegas conference sentiment, it was overall like pretty positive, you know perhaps everybody has a feeling down deep in their stomach that something's not right, you know what I'm suggesting is this inflation story is that deep down feeling that people have. And it can, you know, we've learned over the last year uh, or two that it can go wrong very easily and very quickly. And that, you know, a lot more uh, rate hikes would be necessary uh, for the Fed to get inflation back under control once again. So um, this would be more consistent with some of the views that are out there, you know, where S&P goes to like our Chief strategist Michael Hartnett has had 3,600. Maybe we go back there, but he has also thrown out, you know, the numbers like back to 3,000 um, as a possibility. You know, from my perspective, like when I think, how do we get there? Um, to me, the way we get there is some some replay of what happened, you know, sort of post October 21, where you know nobody fully understood all the stimulus effects, and then you take that and you layer on top of geopolitical event that is very destabilizing. And, you know, the feedback loop starts up once again on inflation and the Fed has to do a lot more. So I think that sort of accurately kind of describes our, our risk framework. So again, constructive as a baseline view, you know, not as constructive as we were starting the year, just because spreads have come in so much but still not, you know, we're ready to turn super negative on stuff. But with that said, you know, I'm watching this and we're watching this very closely to see, you know, is there something that kind of is percolating here that's destabilizing for, you know, let's say the aggregate system where, you know, somehow or another, we have a repeat of, of last year or even, you know, let's say if it's five rate hikes or six rate hikes, that still I think would be very poorly received by the market you know, which is kind of like begrudgingly conceded that maybe three more is needed. Um, but, you know, I think most people 
probably not ready to say a lot more than that is needed. And if the data forced that, you know, I think it could be fairly uncomfortable for, for spreads. And that would sort of help drive some spread widening. Um, yeah, no, yeah, makes sense. Makes, makes a lot of sense. And uh, what, what's, what probability you just signed to the inflation upside surprise? <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think less than 50, we'll say. All right, safe answer, safe answer. Higher than zero, less than fifty. You but uh, you know, I think the like, the 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 bullet point in red on this slide, it, it's kind of said it's about as precise as I'm sort of willing to get. Where it's unpredictable geopolitical events, all I can say is they're more likely nowadays than they used to be. You know, how much more likely? You know, tough to say, um, but they're more likely, and therefore, you know, you you have to, I think, keep in mind these tail risks that are in the system right now. And as, as we stand here right now, the Fed is nowhere, in my opinion, nowhere near mission accomplished in terms of, you know, sort of mitigating that risk that inflation could have a, uh, you know, a nasty further leg up, you know, similar, let's say to what we had in the late seventies, early eighties. I think, that, and that's, you know, that's the struggle for the Fed is to try to get that right, whether, it's, uh, you know, kind of has to do a lot of hiking, try to pause, see how it takes, and, and hopefully it takes. But, you know, recognizing that by pausing, they create risk that, you know, we have another leg higher. And I think, you know, in a sense, and maybe perhaps I'll wrap it up with this comment, you know, the second bullet on this page where we talk about the new inflation era after the November 2020 election, kind of talk about like the fiscal part I think personally doesn't get enough attention as a, a driver uh, of the uh, inflation. But I think even on the monetary part, it's not only um, that the Fed was, let's say, late to hike, but that November 2020 was only you know, a couple of months after Powell announced the flexible average inflation targeting regime. So even there, there was a, a you know, regime change on monetary policy that I don't as far as I know, has yet to be uh, renounced. <laughs> you know, perhaps they would like to, but in a sense, what this break-even uh, story is telling us is that no, actually, we're on the verge of accepting a higher, you know, sort of inflation target, even if the Fed is not going to say that at, at any point, you know, in the near future. Yeah, makes makes sense. Well, well Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, really enjoyed listening to your thoughts. Uh, before you leave, fellow Grateful Dead fan, what's your top song right now of the dead? If you had to put one on right now, which what, what are you into right now? It's it's always Dark Star. That's all. all right. That's a that's a good answer. Mine's uh, Oakland Auditorium, nineteen seventy nine, Shakedown Street. That's uh, my top pick today. Can't go wrong with that either. So. There you go. All right. Well, Chris, thanks so much. I uh, hope to see you in person soon one day, maybe in New York. Be out there in a couple of weeks. Um, thanks for joining us. Great. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, Chris.